is someone I consider to be the ultimate green thumb. And she helped me discern what was what out in those flower beds. Here are some examples of the things we saw on that day. Take a close look. What do you think? Is it a weed or isn't it? Thumbs up if you think that is indeed a weed. You know, I thought for sure this was a flower for keeping. I said, Mom, look at these pretty little flowers here. Let's just leave them alone. And she said, Son, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's actually a weed known as wild violet. It's pretty aggressive. It'll really take over your flower beds and over your yard. I would remove that from the situation if I were you. How about this one? Is it a weed or isn't it? Thumbs up if you think that is indeed a weed. I thought for sure this was a weed. I said, Mom, pass me the spade. Let's get these bad boys out of there. And she said, Son, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's actually a flower known as wild mint. It'll give off a really pleasing aroma in your flower beds. And besides that, the pollinators love it. They'll go crazy for it. You'll have all kinds of extra honeybees and butterflies floating around the yard. I'd leave those poor plants alone. <laughs> How about this one? Take a close look. Is it a weed or isn't it? Thumbs up if you think that is indeed a weed. I thought for sure this was a flower for keeping. I said, Mom, look at these pretty little purple flowers here. You know it'd be nice? Why don't I cut a little bouquet? I'll bring them into Catherine. She'll love it. And she said, Son, I wouldn't do that if I were you. This is actually a weed known as deadly nightshade. <laughs> There's a reason it got that name, Deadly Nightshade. It's pretty poisonous, particularly if you eat it, so make sure you don't do that. I like how she envisioned some scenario where I was just out there in the flower beds chomping down, having myself a feast. Needless to say, we removed this from the flower beds, and I did not bring a bouquet to Catherine. Look, I think you can begin to see how someone like myself with such little knowledge of botany could have trouble discerning what is a weed and what isn't at times. And believe it or not, that is the same exact problem that arises in our gospel lesson today in the parable that Jesus tells. A parable that we are going to examine in depth as we continue our sermon series, Thy Kingdom Come. In this particular series, we're taking a look at what it looks like for us to live under the kingship of Jesus, to be subjects in Jesus' kingdom. And he tells us this parable so that we will know that in his kingdom there will be weeds among wheat. And he also tells us this parable to answer these three questions. One, why are there weeds in this kingdom? Two, how does he as God deal with those weeds once and for all? And three, how should we live in light of the fact that there are weeds in this world? Let's dig into that parable right now and make sense of those questions. It begins at Matthew 13, 24. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the wheat also appeared. So this is a great example of a parable of Jesus. A parable is essentially a teaching device that Jesus uses. It's a short story with earthly examples that are used to make a heavenly point. And for us to figure out what that heavenly point is, we have to discern what is what in that parable. What are all those earthly examples? What do they truly represent? We've got to figure out who or what is that sower, the good seed, the field, the enemy, the weed. Now, usually what I would do right now as a pastor or a preacher is I would take us to all different kinds of Bible passages to prove to you what each and everything in this parable truly represents. But fortunately for me, and quite possibly for you, I don't have to do that today. You see, Jesus himself tells us point blank what each one of these examples truly represents. We had the good fortune that his disciples were once again a little confused on that day. And they were bold enough to ask Jesus, hey, what in the world is going on in this parable? And they do that in Matthew 13, 36. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. So we can fill in all of our blanks right now, and we can take the answers to the bank because Jesus himself gives us that answer. What does everything represent? Well, the sower, Jesus says, is the son of man. That would, of course, be Jesus himself. Those good seeds, that wheat, that is the people of the kingdom. They are the people who acknowledge that they have a king, and that king is Jesus. Those are the children of God. The field, that represents the entire world. The enemy, we probably would have gotten this one, right? The enemy, that would, of course, be Satan. And those weeds, they are the people who don't acknowledge Jesus as king and therefore are defined by their sin and their relationship to Satan. So we know what everything in this parable truly represents. We can be 100% sure, which begs the question, what's the point? A parable is a short story with earthly examples used to prove a heavenly point. What is that heavenly point? Well, there are actually several at play in this parable, but let's start with this simple one right here. Jesus tells the parable of the weeds amongst the wheat so that we would know that in this world, children of the king, that's the wheat, are going to have to deal with weeds, and that is evil people and evil actions. God's children in this world will have to deal with evil people and their evil actions. And you probably didn't need Jesus to tell you a short story to know that. You have two eyes. You can open them. You can look around and you can see evil and evil actions. You can turn on the news and certainly see evil people and evil actions. Jesus promises this, right? He says, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have to deal with weed. Why? Why do we have to deal with weeds? That's actually the exact question that the servants asked the sower in our parable today. They go to him and say, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? In other words, if you're so good at this, if you're such a good farmer, if you're such a good sower, why are there so many weeds in this here field? And since we know what each and everything represents in this parable, we know there is a pretty deep question that is truly being asked here. And that is this. Why does an all-powerful God let bad things happen to his children? Maybe that's a question you've asked yourself before. Why does an all-powerful God let bad things happen to his children? It's a tough question, isn't it? And it's one that God doesn't shy away from at all. In fact, he's already begun to give us an answer in this very parable today. In the first two verses alone, there are two very real reasons why we deal with evil in this world today. Let's see if you can spot them. Once again, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the worker slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. Two very real reasons we deal with evil in this world today. First, I hope you spotted this one. There is an enemy, a very real enemy. I stole the following quote from the movie, The Usual Suspects, and I have never seen it before, so I'm not signing off on that movie at all. But this quote was perfect for this sermon this morning. In that movie, someone says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And that is in large part what he has done in the Western world in the U.S. today. Even amongst the church, a lot of people don't think that Satan is real. He is. He is a very real enemy. And when people don't think he's real, you know what they do? They let their guard down. They fall asleep at the wheel, and then the devil does the things that he wants to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. Prowl about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Those things are so much easier when we let our guard down when we don't think there is a real enemy. And that's actually exactly what happened in the parable, right? A second reason we experience evil is because the servants fell asleep. They weren't on guard. Those servants, they had one job that day, right? They had one job. Watch the field. Don't fall asleep. 
And they had the free will, the choice to do that job or not do that job. And they chose to not do that job. They chose to fall asleep, let their guard down, and an enemy came in and planted weeds amongst that whole field. It's a tale as old as time, right? That is exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, one job, one rule. God says, don't let your guard down. You can do basically whatever. Just don't eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they had the free will to follow that or not follow that. And they chose to not. They let their guard down. They were asleep at the wheel and the enemy sneaks in with his lies and deceit and plants evil throughout the entire world. There are two very real reasons that we deal with evil today. Now, fortunately, on the flip side, there are two very real ways that God deals with evil. He has a two-part plan. And we've actually already seen the first part of that plan in history. The first way that God deals with evil, he sent his son, Jesus. He sends his son, Jesus, who lives a perfect life and dies a perfect death on the cross. And in doing so, he overcomes sin. He overcomes the enemy. He overcomes evil. He overcomes the world, right? He says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And with his perfect life and perfect death, he buys back all of you. He redeems all of us wheat. And now that we have been redeemed, part two is going to come into play, and possibly quite soon. God deals with evil by having claimed the wheat as his own. He is going to send his son Jesus to earth again. Jesus is going to return and he is going to separate the wheat from the weeds. That is what we see at the end of this parable. The servants go to the sower and they say, do you want us to go and pull up these weeds? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. What we have here is a very uncomfortable truth for a lot of people. We have a God who separates. That is how he is going to deal with evil once and for all. He is going to separate the weeds from the wheat. The weeds are those who simply don't acknowledge Jesus as king. And you don't have to kill too many brain cells here to see what metaphor is afoot. They are going to a place that they really don't want to go to. But what God is going to do with his wheat is he's going to take that wheat into his barn. Those are the people that simply acknowledge Jesus as king. And that barn, that's a place where there will be no more suffering, no more pain. Every tear is going to be wiped away from their eyes. That place is, of course, heaven. That is how God is going to deal with evil once and for all. He is going to remove evil and good from each other. There is going to be a sorting. And so we've already answered those first two questions, actually. Why are there weeds and how does God deal with those weeds? Still got one more, though, and that is this. How should we live in light of the fact that there are weeds in this world. Jesus hasn't returned yet, and so we still need to deal with those weeds. And this speaks to the entire subject matter of this sermon series. How are we as God's children to operate in his kingdom under the kingship of Jesus? And this leads me to my very important point of the day. Your job in God's kingdom isn't to judge what is wheat and what is a weed, which is good because you'd be really, really bad at it. In fact, that is what the parable is saying. Listen to these words again here. The servants go to the sower and they say, do you want us to pull up these here weeds? And he says, no, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. In other words, you're going to go out there, those servants, and try to discern which is which and you're going to get it wrong. You're going to think you're pulling up a weed and there are going to be times you're pulling up wheat. So many people, when they hear this parable, they picture a field that looks like this, where it's just so obvious what is wheat and what are weeds. But that is not what is going on in this parable at all. 
In the original Greek, we can tell that this weed that Jesus is talking about is something called bearded darnel. And it looks so much like wheat that they call it false wheat in Israel. They look an awful lot alike. And it takes a master green thumb to know which is which. You are not that master green thumb. In the same sense, there are people in your life who you think are weeds, who are wheat, and vice versa. You're a poor judge of who is who, so leave that job up to God. Your job is not to make a judgment of who is who in this world, which begs the question then, what is your job right here, right now, as subjects in Jesus' kingdom? I'd say your job is simply this, to acknowledge Jesus as your king and to show and tell others about Jesus, whether you think they are wheat or a weed. What if, and we'll start with the second part there, you encounter someone in your life who you are 100% sure you know without a doubt that they are wheat. Your job is to acknowledge Jesus as your king in front of them and be a good ambassador and show and tell them about Jesus anyways because you might be wrong and they might really need your example. They might really need to hear the gospel from you. On the flip side, there's someone in your life you're 100% sure they're a no good dastardly weed. What are you to do with them? You are still to show and tell them about Jesus because God might be working directly through you to help them emerge as the wheat that they truly are. And ultimately, your job is the first part of that statement, to acknowledge Jesus as your king. And that, as I already said, is the true difference between wheat and those weeds. I haven't said it yet here. But there is a way right at the end of the harvest that you can tell the difference between that bearded darnel and the wheat. You see, the wheat does something right before it's harvested. Its heads bow down ever so slightly. Whereas that bearded darnel, it remains stock straight upright. In the same sense, that is how God is going to tell the difference between what is wheat And what are those weeds? The wheat are those that are going to bow their heads and acknowledge Jesus as their king. That is your job right here, right now. And my prayer for you this week is simply this. May you do your job. May you acknowledge Jesus as your king in every way, shape, and form. And then go and tell and show others about Jesus, whether you think they are wheat or a weed. May you do this in Jesus' name. Amen.